Hey, good morning, everyone. Voice Pastor Q. Thank you all you guys for joining us again for our 9 a.m. service here at the Homicide Hotel. Thank you guys for joining us on your uh, Facebook lives and sharing with us this morning what God has given to us. At this time, we'll have our inspirational message given by Ms. our very own Connie Cuffin. So thank you guys for uh, staying tuned in, allowing us to uh, be a blessing to you guys this morning and share with you guys what God has given us this morning. So thank God. Come on, Connie, we'll go with the inspirational message and we'll come back with the teaching of the word. Amen. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Word Movies. And once again, Happy New Year. It's still early in the New Year, so Happy New Year. <laughs> um, today, I'm going to be reading an inspirational message, and it's going to be coming from Matthews 5, verses 14 through 16, and it's called The Shining Light. Uh, Matthews 5, 14 through 16, you are the light of the world. The town built on a hill cannot be hid. A shining light. Stephen told his parents that he needed to get to school early every day, but for some reason he never explained to them why it was so important. Yet they made sure he arrived at Northview High School at 7.15 each morning. On a wintry day during his junior year, Stephen was in a car accident that sadly took his life. Later, his mom and dad found out why he'd been going to school so early. Each morning he had some friends each morning, he and some friends had gathered at the school entrance to greet other students with a smile, a wave, and a kind word. It made all students, even those who weren't popular, feel welcomed and accepted. As a believer in Jesus, Stephen wanted to share his joy with those who desperately needed it. His example lives on as a reminder that one of the best ways to shine the light of Christ's love is by gestures of kindness through a welcoming spirit. In Matthew 5, Verses 14 through 16, Jesus reveals that in him we're the light of the world in a town built on a hill. Ancient cities were often built of white limestone truly standing out as they reflected the blazing sun. May we choose not to be hidden but to give light to everyone in the house. And as we let our light shine before others, may they experience the welcoming love of Christ. So let's be God's representative of shining light. Amen. Amen. Thank Connie for that reading this morning. Praise God. Turn with me to the book of Deuteronomy. It's in the Exodus, uh, Old Testament next to Exodus, the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 29. We will be in the 29th verse in the book of Deuteronomy, uh, chapter 29, and we will be at the uh, 29th verse. So turn with me to that's Deuteronomy, chapter 29. And we will be at the uh, 29th verse of the book of Deuteronomy. When you everybody have it, say amen. 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 Praise God. The scripture reads, it says, The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. Read it one more time. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. Father, we thank you for this word. We thank you for the message today, oh Father God. We thank you for blessing us and keeping us in all things. Thank you for your grace, your mercy, your truth. We thank you, Father God, for keeping us and for the revealing and teaching and preaching of your word this morning, Father God. Lord, may you be with us. You give us strength, wisdom, and knowledge in all things. We pray and thank you. Amen. Amen. He's going to ask all you guys to uh, mute your phone, cell phones, don't turn them off, just mute them or put them on silent. Amen. How many of you guys know about psychics? Some more psychics. Miss Cleo. Cleo, you know, that's what you know about psychics, Miss Cleo. Um, a lot of times I'm up in the middle of the night, the TV's running, I see the infomercials for these things called California psychics, right? And they, they tell you that they can tell you your fortune. And, uh, your future and your, your life and who's coming about riches and, and, and people call them to get a reading on their future. And a lot of times I wake up in the middle of the night and watch an infomercial, watch the TV, and they tell you to call and confront a psychic, right? And then this scripture came to me, it says that the secret things belong to our God, but those things which are revealed belong to us. How many of you are okay with God not telling you certain things? You got to be. You got the thing is, you have to be okay with not knowing everything and being able to serve God. You have to be okay with that. 
The Bible says that when you come to God, you must have childlike faith. It, didn't, it doesn't mean that your faith is childish. What it represents is that I am a child of God. It says God is my father. I trust him for things even though he don't tell me everything. Now, if you're nosy like I am, you want to know everything. How many of you are nosy in the kingdom of heaven? You want to know everything God is doing. You want, you want to find out what he's doing. You want to know if the person I'm dating is the right one. Is this the right career move? I want to know what God has for me. I want to know right now. I want to know if this is the relationship. I want to know what career I'm supposed to be in. I, I just need to know what God has for me right now. Notice that that was none of the requests of none of the disciples. And when you're serving God as a Christian and a person whose God is, is their father, it's not designed for you and I to know everything. You know what God told me? Told me, if I told you everything, you'd mess it up anyway. Yeah. Yeah. He said, I know of the way that I take of thee, told Job, I know of the way that I take of thee, for when I have tried thee, you may come forth as gold. God says, I know the way, I got this. Yeah. Am I the only one who types something in their GPS to go somewhere and I question the instructions? Why is it taking me this way? Yeah. There's a shorter way. Can I tell you, based on ways and GPS, they're taking you the safest route. Yeah. The safest route. Now, you know a faster way. Your, your way may know some potholes. You may know some back streets and things like that. But it said this is the safest route. But you say, I don't know why it's taking me this way. We question that. You know what? Because we know a better way. So we think. So we think. You know, the thing about it is, when I was learning that God is showing us that when we have this childlike faith, you must be able to serve him without knowing everything, one of the things that got Adam and Eve in trouble, and I want you to go to understand the scripture and teach him. The, 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 the tree was called a tree of knowledge of good and evil. Mm -hmm. and, 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 the, and the devil said, listen, God don't want you to take of this tree because he know that in the day that you know, that you eat of it, you shall be like God's knowing good from evil. You, he don't want you to be like him. But my thing is this, is that we live in a society where, just like Adam and Eve, we feel like God is withholding things from us. You know, I've, I've met so many people on this path, and so have you. You've met people who, who have gifts. Not in church, but have gifts. How many people you know people that's not in church, but have gifts? People who can have dreams, and people who, you know, call God the universe, and people who sage, and okay, people who deal with crystals, and we all have that one friend, family member that, 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 that peeks into the world and tells us things that we didn't think that they should know because, listen, psychics and things are real. But God tells you and I to try the spirit, not the spirit. He didn't say the reading that you was going to get from the psychic was wrong. He said it just wasn't for you to know. Because when you know things, you'll mess things up. You know, the thing about it is, in the, in, the, in the book of Samuel, when Saul, in God's relationship, was tarnished because he didn't utterly destroy all the Malachites, the Bible says that Saul went to seek out a medium. A medium is a type of psychic to see because he couldn't hear from God no more. So he told him, say, listen, I need you to find me a medium or a woman who is skilled in this, saying, so I can actually hear from God. Now, listen to this. If God has cut you off, now you're going to a medium or a psychic. And the Bible says in Deuteronomy that God had cut these type of people off. Not because the gift they had is because that what they were informing the people and what they dealt with. So you must understand this. The reason why God doesn't want us dealing in certain things is because they open certain portals. Yeah. Yeah. You was young, you played with Ouija boards and all that type of stuff. Certain things you do open up spiritual portals. Sex open up spiritual portals. Things that you expose yourself to open up spiritual portals. And you are the way you are because of spiritual portals and things you have, you have opened up. And the Bible says that God was trying to keep them from a tree of knowledge of good and evil because God just didn't want them to be exposed to certain things because we understand that the exposure of things are gateway to other things. I am the way I am because I've opened certain portals and dealt with things that God never wanted me to deal with. Yeah. 
Not that God was trying to keep me from the good feeling. God was trying to keep me from what it was going to, what the doors it was going to open. I get it mixed up sometimes. I think God's trying to keep me from fun. I think God's trying to keep me from having a good time. God says, that's not what I'm trying to keep you from. In that good time, you're going to open up certain things. You open up certain things. You open up your temple in your house to things that's going to have you confused. Come on now. And then we, we get so confused because, be honest, I don't want to scare nobody, is that you have so many spirits inside of you that you've taken on from other people. You take on so many spirits, so many different things that you don't even know who you are. And God has to say no to some of your prayer requests because a lot of times it's not even you that's praying. It's the spirit that you've taken on that you're praying. Yeah. The Bible said, for we know not what we ought to pray for, what the spirit itself make of intercession for us. That when I'm praying for something, the spirit has to step in and say, no, God, that's not what he wants. This is what he means. The, the, the interpreter. You know, on my job, I don't, my Spanish is okay, but there's always somebody who, there, who can interpret what the person is trying to tell me. That's how it works. When I'm talking and I'm praying to God and I'm telling God what I want, the Holy Spirit steps in and he intercedes on my behalf and says, God, this, this is QQ's praying for this, but this is what he needs. He steps in and he begins, it's, it's like, I use this analogy a lot of time. A child goes to a restaurant and the mom and dad say, what you want? The first thing the child does is points to the most expensive and biggest thing on the menu. And the mom say, no, he don't really want that filet mignon. He wants the chicken tenders with the applesauce and the fruit punch. That's what he wants. He don't even have his teeth ain't even strong enough for that. But great teaching, the Bible tells you and I to desire the sincere milk of the word that we may grow thereby. Why, do, why desire milk? Because he says you're not ready for solid food. Now listen, the, 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 the teaching is, is that he's saying you and I are desiring something that requires us to feed off of meat, but you're not ready for meat. You're still in a place where you need milk. You see, you see what he's teaching? He said you're not even in a place where you're ready for solid food yet. You're still in a place where you need milk. Somebody still has to break down your food and chew it up for you and give it to you. That's where you are in your, I know that sounds nasty, but that's where you are in your spiritual walk. But God says you're asking for me right now. But he says, listen, you're in a place where you need to desire the sincere milk of the word that you can grow thereby. Because I have to understand too that when I come to Christ, I came to Christ immaturely seeking something instead of looking to serve him. Notice this, the, the churches have become like what the psychics and things are teaching because now we're coming to church hoping that the thing that we're desiring that the pastor even preaches on it and whatever that we're desiring is coming whether it's something from the future love relationships career destiny life path we're all coming to god looking for god to manifest that and we're and, and then you know what here is great teaching, right? When you serve God for something, you make every scripture you hear about that. Am I right about that? Yeah. When you're serving him for something, every time you hear a word, you make it about that. You make stuff that has nothing to do with that about that because that's where your heart is. And since that's where your heart is, you make everything about what you want and is nothing has nothing to do with the relationship with God is just like I'm on the phone with the psychic and I'm waiting to hear what the good things for me and what God has for me. Notice, notice God had to tell Abraham this. He says, Abraham, when he came to him, Abraham, he says, uh, Abraham, I'm your exceedingly and great reward. Meaning that, that the relationship you have with me is better than any other. The next thing Abraham said, God, what you going to give me? He did the, the, the similar type of, he, he visited uh, King Solomon the same way. He, here's something I want you to understand, right? He visited Abraham, the Bible says, when Abraham was awake. He visited King Solomon when he was asleep. Let me tell you the difference in teaching. When Abraham, when he visited Abraham and he was awake, that means his flesh was awake. So when he spoke, he spoke from his flesh. When he visited Solomon, 
Solomon's flesh was asleep, but his spirit was awake. So when Solomon spoke, he said, Solomon, what do you want for me to give to you? And, and so, you know what Solomon said? Solomon says, I just need enough wisdom, or I need wisdom. The Bible tells in James for all of us to be able to ask for wisdom. He says, ask for it liberally. And he uh, asked God for wisdom to be able to rule over such great people because he was a young man. And God said that what Solomon had asked for pleased him because he didn't ask for like the life, everlasting life or everlasting riches or the hands of his enemy. He said he didn't ask for any of that. What, what he asked for was the wisdom to be able to rule over his people. And God said, since you didn't ask for anything selfish, I'm going to give you everything that you didn't ask for. Because the basically what the Bible is teaching is that the prayer pleased God. It's like if we go to uh, Matthew 6 and 33, and he says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. We must understand, too, I'm not serving God to receive something from God. I'm serving God because he's God and God alone. I have to get to a place, and I have to, as a pastor, it's important for me to get you to a place where you're serving God just strictly for that he's God and that you're looking to be a servant, you're looking to be a disciple, not that you're serving God, hoping that there's that, that he's going to reward you for something. Now, there's nothing wrong with looking to be able to get blessed, but, but when that is your whole motive of, of coming to church and giving, looking to get back, then you're, you're, you're serving God on false pretenses. Because it has to be able to get to a place where it's pure. Because if God ever stops doing something, then you'll stop coming to church. You'll stop wanting to be involved. And you, and I'm going to tell you, a, a bad place to be into. A lot of people, what the Bible tells, the psalm, he says, you know, he, you ever wonder why he had to tell the psalmist, I think it was Psalm 37, he says, fret not thyself for evil doers. You know why? Because God noticed that his people were upset when they were seeing other people get blessed and they wasn't. That's a, that's a, a lot of us are in a place where we see things going on around us and we see other people getting blessed and we're saying, God, when is my blessing coming? Now you're comparing. Somebody got married, when are you going to get married? Somebody got a house, somebody got a cop. Now you're comparing. Well, if I'm serving God and I'm going to church every Sunday, I'm reading my Bible, I'm doing everything right. But I'm doing everything right and everybody that's doing all the opposite things are, 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 the opposite things are getting everything that I want from God. God says, listen, Reason why I haven't given it to you yet? Because I'm trying to cleanse your motive. You're, are you serving me so you can look like them? Is that why you're being obedient? Uh, I, I, are you serving me because you, you believe that, I, um, that, that there's something I can do that nobody else can do? Or is the relationship with you and I pure? We're going back to the teaching. Up, up, up in the middle of the night, and I'm watching these things that keep coming across California psychics, and uh, people say, you know what, she told me things that um, I never knew until, and, and that stuff is true. Psychics do have the ability to be able, and there are people, I like psychics, and Sue's there, that's able to give you a reading and tell you certain things. And those things will be true. I mean, one time I was listening, I don't know, one time I was watching, I think, uh, the Kardashians or something like that, and there was an episode where I think they said that the father, I think before he died, went to go see a psychic, and the psychic told him, he says, listen, your family name is going to be great. And that was true. But here's, here's the thing about it, right? If what you don't understand is that if God, God is withholding certain things from you because he wants to be a father, meaning that he wants you to trust him for the unknown, not for you to find it out. That's what that was, like I said, going back to Adam and Eve, that was the big place. For, there was a tree of knowledge of what? Good and evil. When, when Adam and Eve took from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and, and God came and visited them, and he asked Adam, Adam, where are thou? Meaning God knew where he was, that when he said where was he, he was talking about his mental, because God knows all things. He was basically saying, where are we? Adam said, I, I hid myself because I, I knew that I was naked. God said, who told you that? And as I've taught you before, he says, Adam, boy, you, you've been naked the whole time. Who told you you were naked? He's basically saying, who gave you that information? Who, who told you? Because listen, Adam, if you understand the great teaching of it, Adam, though we know them as to be naked, as to, be, to, as to mean no clothing, 
Though they were naked, they had a covering, if you understand what I'm saying. They were naked, but they had a covering. When they took of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, they lost their spirit and they became their covering. Listen, why do you think the Islamic and the Muslim women wear coverings? Why do you think the men cover their head? It represents a covering. Do you know that when God told them to put the blood of the lamb over top of their household, that represents a covering? Do you know that you have a covering over your life that you can't even see when you're in Christ? I'm covered already. But some people want you to know they're covered, so they put on the clothing to make to let you know that they're covered. But sometimes you could have on the covered clothing, but still not be covered in the spirit. You know what? When when your when your mother and your grandmother, I hear people say, "I'm here today because of my grandmother's prayer." You know when your mother and grandma would pray. You know what they pray tonight? Cover them. And they pray, they, the old, older people pray and say, Lord, I want you to cover my child, my daughter, my family in the blood of Jesus, meaning that I want you to put a covering over them. Meaning that when whatever happens that in, in, um, in the Old Testament, when a death angel came through and they, had the blood, and they had the blood of the lamb on the doorpost, it said that the death angel passed them by because of the covering that they had. Now, it's, it, the, the same thing applies today. So the uh, Jewish people celebrate what is called the Passover. And the reason why they celebrate the Passover, because they're celebrating at the time when the death angel came through and it passed them over because of the covering that they had. So when Adam and Eve took up the tree of knowledge of good and evil, they were spiritual beings, but their flesh was their covering. Once they took up the tree of knowledge of good and evil, they died. So now they actually became their flesh. And then God had, to, and then after they became their flesh, then they had to sew fig leaves together because they knew that they were naked. They were naked one time and didn't have any fig leaves. But then once they took up the tree of knowledge of good and evil, they, they, the Bible says that they sewed themselves together fig leaves. And when God came, God said, that's not acceptable. Then God had to basically get other clothing and tunics to um, cover them and what the Bible doesn't teach you that in order for God to clothe them in animal clothing that means that God had to kill an animal a what a innocent animal so God was teaching in the Old Testament he says listen I'm going to make clothing for Adam and Eve out of an innocent animal and put it on them so when I see them I see the, cl I see the garments of the innocent animal he was already right there teaching about a covering he says, you know what, um, I have to, and listen, he covered them in the clothing of an animal that was sacrificed so that he could see them not in their sin. When he saw them, he saw their covering. So when God passes by, and what makes God pass me by from death? He sees the blood of the lamb. That's, that's, that's what puts you and, and you and I in relationship with God. When God sees the blood of the lamb over our lives, that's what makes God pass us, pass us by. So Adam and Eve takes up this tree of knowledge of good and evil, and immediately they know all things. God says, listen, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't want you to know certain things. There's, there's, there, there's certain things I don't want you to know. You know, the Bible teaches you and I that God is saying, I need you to learn to walk by faith, not by sight, right? And periodically, I'm asking God to remove the blindfold because we walk in this blind faith. You say, well, God, we walk by faith, uh, not by sight. Sometimes I want to remove the blindness. You know when somebody's trying to surprise you, the first thing they tell you to do is what? Cover your eyes. Or they blindfold you and, and, they, and they have to guide you somewhere. You get to faith and say, you know what, God, I want to peek. I'm, I'm tired of just listening. I want to be able to see what you have for me. God says, no, you, you have to be able to trust me. You have to be able to have this blind faith. I can't tell you everything before time. You know, the thing about it is, is that a few points I wanted to make today with this is um, God said that when he brought the children of Israel out of Egypt, that he took them a long way. 
And the reason why he said he took them a long way is because if he had taken them the shorter way, they would have ran into their adversary. And God said if they would run into their adversary, then they would have ran back into Egypt. So God said he took them the longer way because the short way would have ran them into something would have, would have been discouraged them, would have, would have discouraged them, and it would have sent them back. So he says, listen, I'm going to take you my way because the way that you know is basically going to discourage you and it's going to turn you back. So what I want to do, I'm going to take you the longer way, even though you know a shorter way. What is God saying? God says, you know what? I know it feels like the way that I'm taking you is taking a long way, but you have to trust me on this path. Though you're on a path, but the Bible tells us to not grow weary and uh, well doing for you shall reap if you faint not. God says you have to trust me with this slow motion. You got to trust me with this slow motion. You know, how many of us have gotten things fast? There's a saying, fast things don't last. God says you have to trust me with the patience. You have to trust me. You have to trust me doing things slow. I know that you want it real bad, but God says you have to trust me. The reason why I'm doing it this way. A lot of times we say, you know what, man, it's just, I, I tell God sometimes, sometimes it's just taking you too long to do what I'm asking you to do. And God says, you know what? It's taking me too long, and it's taking you too long to develop to be it. He puts it back on me. He says, it's not that it's taking me too long to do it. It's taking you too long to develop. I say, why? Oh, I thought I was waiting on you. He says, no, you're not waiting on me. I'm waiting on you to be able to handle that what you're asking for. God showed me one time. He says, Q, when you pray, pray, believe you've already received he says, what he's, God showed me, he says, everything that you ask me for, I have you in preparation for it when you ask for it. So this is what God will do. You ask God for something. If he says yes and amen to it, notice that everything that I'm asking him for, he's now trying me with the, let me say this, if whatever I'm asking God for, he is now trying me with the very things it takes to be able to keep what I'm asking for. Yeah. So God says, so when I give it, I don't want my gift to become a curse. I don't, I don't want it to be like everything else we ask for because there's a lot of things you and I ask for that we don't want anymore. So God says, I, I, I want it so that when I actually give it to you, you've already went through what it takes to be able to handle it and know how to keep it because the Bible says to whom much is given, much is required. See, a lot of times we want God to give us things, but we don't want the requirements that come along with it. How many of us know that there's hate and things that come along with your blessings? Yeah. You can't want to get blessed and want to be liked too. Yeah. It just don't work that way. Yeah. You, are, are, are you okay with being blessed and being disliked? Yeah. Some people are not okay with that. Mm -hmm. Are you okay with being blessed and people don't celebrate your stuff? Mm -hmm. People tell everybody else they stuff nice but they don't sell your stuff nice. Are you okay with that? Are you okay with being mistreated because you're blessed? Some people are not okay with that. Because you get things from God and then you complain about the consequences of the things that you got. It's like, ever since I got this cop, ever since I got this bag, ever since I got these shoes, you, they've been acting funny. Hmm. Well, do you not want the shoes? Do you not want the car? Do you not want the house? Seems like since I, I started telling people about my promotion, everybody started acting funny. Did you not want the promotion? God says you're asking me for stuff and now you complain about what that bought you. Do you not want it? Or right, since I got somebody, she acting funny now. Cause she ain't sick. <laughs> to have come with requirements. Anytime God gives, I'm going to tell you what, man. Sometimes you're one blessing away from losing a friendship. Yeah. Listen, I'm teaching you. Yes, you one blessing away from losing a friendship. Yeah. Yes, yeah. See, some people are content and happy when we feel like we're on the same playing field. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you get one more thing. But you get one more thing, yeah. and that's it. You start acting funny. What do they say? Birds of a feather flock together? Yeah, some people, people, listen, they tell you to be around people that has more money than you. People 
who have the same desire, people that's going to challenge you. But a lot of times we're comfortable being around people who are okay just sitting in the same mess. So you know what? When I, when I pray for something, God is developing me to be able to receive it. He says, because let me teach you, a lot comes along with what you're asking for, man. So I got to develop you so that so when you get it, you know that, hey, it, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a possibility that when God blesses me, my circle change. You know what happens? God will bless you and your circle change. And then you find yourself in a place where you're by yourself. And then you feel like, well, it's like, don't nobody mess with me no more. No. Sometimes when you get elevated, yeah. Sometimes when you get elevated, there's isolation in there. And you say, you know what? I didn't know that being blessed was going to cause all of this. As soon as I got some, it seemed like everything was okay until I had something. God said, I got to be able to develop you to have an I don't care type of attitude. That's what God is saying. I got to bless you to be able to don't care. Because you care too much. You're not ready for these blessings because God says, I'm trying to develop you to have an attitude that doesn't care about what people say, that you're only focused on me. Because if I bless you before then, then you're no longer, then you're going to feel bad about what you have. Man, I'm going to tell you what, this is, this is a true thing, right? Some of us got friends, or whatever you call them, that, that, that uh, make you feel bad about your best. Yeah. Come on now. Yeah. How many of you got people? You always talk about your job, what God going to do, and what you going to get. There's more to life than that. You always shopping. Y'all always out to eat. Mm. Yeah. What is that coming from? You know? You know, what God was showing me this too was that Jesus knew exactly who Judas was the whole time. Here's the thing, right? Between here's the difference between me and Jesus is that if I know I have a Judas, I'm gonna stop hanging around with the Judas. If I go to a psychic, oh, well, here's better now, right? Here's some God showed me, and you may not agree with this, right? So, Judas, Judas was supposed to be there, even though Jesus knew who Judas was. The problem is, have you ever heard something about somebody you were around, and it changed how you looked at them? Well, that's probably why a lot of people stopped going to this church too. Because they probably heard stuff about me, right? But that's just how things go, right? Right, right? right. You preach good, but I heard something. You know, you should stop coming here because of something I heard. Whether true or false, I look at him differently now. But before you heard what you heard, I was next to Jesus to you. But I didn't I didn't ask to be there. That's where you put me. You put me there. I'm just a man. Now, I, have, I speak his word, but what I'm saying is that you, somebody allowed something they heard to deter them from what I was saying. And we do that. We, we don't develop our own relationships with people. We allow other people to tell us about other people. Right? I have to, I have to be a place in my life where... I develop my own relationships and friendships yeah. and to be able to determine the type of people they are based off of who and mind their relationship. Because I, I want to teach you something. The Bible didn't say that Judas did anything wrong to anybody else. He only did it to Jesus. Yeah. He was assigned to that. You, have, you, you ever have a person, he is a great teacher, right? This goes to me all the time. I always have a person that do something wrong to me, but doesn't do nothing wrong to anybody else. And I may ask them, hey, you ever notice something about something? No, they good. <laughs> the reason why, because you must understand, Judas wasn't out deceiving anybody but Jesus. Because he was assigned to do that. 
Do you know that Judas was part of the reason that Jesus was going to get to the cross? So Judas, Jesus says, though I know who he is, I have to keep him close because he's part of my assignment. Yeah. I'm going somewhere with this. Sometimes God sends you somebody to develop you that's part of your assignment, but they're no good for you. You got to listen to what I'm saying. You got to listen to what I'm saying. God says they're part of your assignment, but they're still no good for you. But they're there to show you something about you. Listen, we go through relationships and stuff. If we say this, you say, you know what? If I had known that in the beginning, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have chose you. I wouldn't allow you to take me through that. But guess what? It took you to show me what my worth. Hold up. The thing that I wish I had not done, it took that to show me my worth? God says everything I sent to you is not good. It, it, it may not be good for you. No, no, no. Let me say this. It may not be the person. You know, people say in, in this term, let me speak, they say some people come into your life for a reason, season, lifetime. You know, they always yeah. preaching that cliche, right? Yeah. God says, I may send people in your life who are not good, but what they have in them is the very thing that's going to develop you. Yeah. 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 But God says, you know what? A lot of times, this is what God's been showing me. Right. See, as a pastor that has to move in this perfect love. Perfect love of God is mature. Mature love is to know that you are a member of this church, right? And you talk about me and I know it, right? But I'm supposed to act like I don't know that you do it. That's, that's pastoral love. Know what you say, know how you feel about me, and still gotta pray for you and love on you and act like I don't know. That's, that's just real, that's the type of that's what I'm called to do. He said, now that's phony. Now that ain't phony. Because Jesus was being phony too if he hung around Judas and allowed him to hold the money. Was Jesus phony? He was around Judas every day and knew he was going to betray him. But every day somebody bringing me something that you said. Guess what? I want to tell you to leave. Guess what God is teaching me? How to love. He said what? He said, you mean to tell me you can't love past what they say? Jesus. He said, I'm going to develop you. Oh, oh, so you want to be a pastor. You want to go to a higher calling, but you can't handle the bickering and the talking and what they saying. And he said, I'm not going to let you put them out. I'll let them leave when their season is up. I'll let them leave once I have developed in you. Come on. See, when people come here, when people come into my life, they have a spirit inside of them that's designed to develop me. They can't leave until that happens. Let me tell you what. You don't have to delete a person. You don't have to block a person. Mm. They'll leave when their season is up. Yeah. Yeah. They'll leave once you have developed and matured from the spirit that they have bought. That's for you. God says, you know what? That's why he puts some of the worst people in our past. Yeah. He says, I'm trying to teach you how to love. Yeah, yeah, how yeah, to yeah, love yeah, unconditionally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you, I know you want to, listen, God don't want you to confront everything. Yeah. You know what though? Sometimes, you ever say, you ever say, you know, going back to the psychic stuff, you ever say, it's just certain things I wish I had not known. I wish you didn't tell me that about that person. Because guess what it's done? It causes me to look at them differently now. Guess what God said? See, that's why I didn't want you to know it. Yeah. You know, the thing about this, and um, we're all of probably African-American descent in here. Um, 
I ask God sometimes to help me love Caucasian people without remembering the stuff they taught me in school with roots and stuff like that. You know, I, I want to be able to learn to, to love Caucasian people without my history. And I know that burns somebody up to say, but every time I see Caucasian people, I see my history. And, I, and a lot of us struggle with that because of what we have been taught in our history yeah. and actually how we treat yeah. them yeah. is based off of our history. Yeah. 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 People say the most unforgiving culture is blacks. Yeah. Mm. Mm -hmm. You say, well, how can we be most unforgiving? You see what we've been through, right? God places us in places. And I'm saying, you know what? I, I wish I never knew what white people ancestors took my people through because now it's just every time I, they do something it's racist to me because it just that's where that's what I'm taught I wish I didn't know what y'all did I can't escape what y'all did I can't see everything you do sir we close at nine racist <laughs> that's just how I feel y'all hiring no racist y'all want a black people working here it's just not hiring but everything, they say on my job, you ready to black people pull the race car. You ever hear you say that? It's always the race car. That's where we are, we're the race car. We've got to understand what we've been through. It's because of, you know, we were informed of something. But God, but God is saying, listen, um, I, I want you to still be able to love people based off of what they did to your ancestors. That's a mature type of love. It's hard to get there. I understand that. Love people based off of the love I have shown you not off of conditions. Yeah. Jesus still loved Judas three years through the teachings and preachings and their tour, never treated Judas any differently, but knowing Judas was going to be the one who set him up. Let me tell you how slick Jesus is. This is something that nobody ever paid attention to, right? So, you know, on their little tour, Jesus, Judas was the one that held the money bag, right? This is how he worked Judas. He knew that Judas was a thief and a deceiver the whole time. You know what he put him in charge of? The money. <laughs> you, gotta, you gotta understand. Can I, can I teach you who we are sometimes? Do you do this? Do you tell people stuff sometimes just to see who they gonna tell? <laughs> sometimes we do this sometimes. Sometimes we send out testers, right? See how much my friend you are. I'm going to tell you something, see if it get back to me. <laughs> Jesus, was, Jesus was manipulating the situation the whole time. He says, Judas, I know exactly who you are, so I'm going to, I'm going to put you in charge of your own struggle. <laughs> I'm going to put the thief <laughs> in charge of the money. Yeah. Guess what he was showing them two things. He says, I'm loving you through the conditions, still trusting you with something I know you can't be trusted with. Well, I thought God said he won't give us no more than we can handle. Yeah, but he said, you know what? Because Judas could say, well, listen, you didn't trust me with anything because of what you knew about me. He says, you know what? Even though I knew everything about you, I still gave it to you. Because I'm going to tell you what. You and I all have a lot of people we know, but we have a very few people we confide in and tell our serious things to. You have a level of friends. You tell her this because you know she'll tell everybody about when you're promoting something. You want everybody to know. And then you got a friend that you tell something to that you hope they're not telling to nobody else. Yes. Amen. Because of basically this, if what I've been told, if they tell somebody else's business, He'll tell you. That's why if you got if you're smart, you got a friend that tell you everybody else's business, but you don't tell them nothing. <laughs> <laughs> if you're smart, talk about it. You don't. Yeah. Yeah. You don't exchange information. That's not what smart people do. You don't listen to them tell you everybody else's stuff, but they start telling you. You just don't do that. Yeah. Jesus did. He said, you know what? I'm, I'm going to keep Judas because I, I, I need Judas. Though I know that Judas is going to betray me, he's still part of the plan. God, Jesus, Jesus said, I'm not going to remove Judas because 
of what I know about him because what I do know is he is part of the plan. And then this, this is what God has shown me a lot of times. Yeah, you may find out something that a person is doing. You know what? The thing about it is, even in ministry, um, God has called you and I to a place of love where he's caused us to love people that we know really don't like us. Yeah. 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 yeah, that's a hard thing to do. Yeah. To be around somebody and talk to somebody you know really be talking about you for real. Mm -hmm. And to call you and act like they ain't said nothing. Yeah. <laughs> and you say, you know what? Let me let me let me let me teach you something you don't know, right? If if you stop being around phony people, you stop being around all people. Yeah. You bless what I'm saying. Say it again. If you stop being around phony people, yeah. you stop being around all people. Yeah. Why does God keep sending me all these phony people? This, that God is trying to teach me how to love. Yeah. Everything that I'm dealing with, God is teaching me how to love. He's developing my character through the people that he sends my way. He's developing me through people. You know what he does? You struggle with forgiveness and all those type of things and God sends you. Listen, this is this is this is what you probably don't understand about great teaching, right? In order for you to know the depths of love and forgiveness, right? God has to allow somebody to come in to break you. Yes. And then expect you to recover from that. And then then you say something to God. Say something to God, like, you know what? I don't care what happens, I can't forgive. And you say, God, I want to know the depths of your love. He said, forgive. He said, I only allow certain such to come in your life to hurt you so you can know what it's like to forgive. So you can know the depths of my love. That's how God works. God says, I allow all these things to happen to you just so you can turn around and learn how to forgive. And you say, you know what? I don't care. Well, no, I may forgive, but I ain't going to never forget. <laughs> God says, no, I allowed that to happen to you so you can learn the depths of my love. And then when you begin to learn the depths of my love and know that I forgave you for everything and what it felt that the, the struggle that you went through forgiving, then you will be able to know the depths of my love and then you're going to be able to be made perfect from that. And then you'll, be, you, you, you'll come to grips and understand it and you say, you know what? Because a lot of times I say stuff like, you know what? If, if I had if I had known then what I know now, I would have made different decisions. But God says the reason why I kept you in the blind because I was going to teach you a lesson through your bad decisions. Come on now, yeah, come on, Pastor, talk about it. Go ahead. See, you gotta understand. He's he's making me through my bad decisions. After King David sinned and slept with Bathsheba's wife and sent her husband to battle, God says that the sword should never depart from the house. And, and people who don't know good word and teaching, they thought that King David had an actual sword in his house. But you know word of scripture, you know that the, the sword is the word of God. Guess what God said? This is how gracious God is. God says, David, you're not going to die, but the sword shall never depart from your house. You know what he was saying? I'm going to put my word in your house. I'm going to put my consequences in your house. And you know that I chastise those whom I love. You reap what you sow. I'm going to put the consequences in your house. People didn't understand that. When they kept saying, he told, God, he told David that the sword should never depart from his house. What is the sword? He said, the word of God is quick and powerful and sharp and two edged sword. He says, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to allow your steps to be ordered. I'm going to allow you to be developed with the consequences and the chastisement of my word. Yeah. He says, that, that, that's what's never going to depart from your house. The consequence of what you're doing. He says, I'm going to put it in your face every day, but I'm going to still love you. Show you grace and mercy. He says, I'm going to put it in your face every day what you have done. I'm going to put it right in your face every day. God says, and guess what? You, you're going you're gonna to pray that I remove it, and I'm not going to remove it. I'm going to keep it right there in your face every day. But guess what? Though the consequences of God's word were still there, God never stopped blessing David. But the consequences were still there. His chastisement. Man, God is still dealing with you and I for things we did a long time ago. It doesn't mean that he hasn't forgiven us. Here's the thing about it, right? 
Jesus told Peter that the devil desired to sift him as wheat. He told him that. And the thing about it is, is that I like the fact, here's something, right? He dealt with Peter in a way that I felt like he could have dealt with Job but he did it differently. Like, he told Peter that the devil wanted him, but he didn't tell Job what the devil was, you know, what the devil's plans were, but he told Peter what the devil's plans were. The thing about it is, is that Jesus, as he was hanging around Judas, was hanging around Peter, knowing that Peter would deny him three times. Basically what he's saying is that Peter would get around other people and Peter would find himself in a situation where people say, hey, don't you know Jesus? Like, no, I don't know him like that. No, I don't know him. He says, Peter, you're going to deny me three times. He says, but listen, Satan, Satan desires to sift thee as wheat, but the, the thing is, Peter, since I know that you're going to deny me, and since I know that the devil desires you, once the devil take you through what he's going to take you through, it's going to remove the fact that you'll ever deny me. You got to understand why he did. He says, because after what the devil takes you through, oh, he's going to remove all of that that you have in you. Guess what he was basically saying? Peter denied Jesus because he was fearful. He says, once the devil gets you to a place, you're no longer be, you're no longer be fearful when you come out of the test with him. But since I know that you're going to deny me, I must allow the devil to work in your life to be able to remove fear. Mm -hmm. You know, somebody had a conversation. Yeah. I had a conversation with a guy over there. A lot of you guys know who Mike Tyson is, right? And I think I've told this before. It's one of my favorite stories to reflect on is that um, when Mike Tyson was getting ready to fight Buster Douglas, Buster Douglas had a fear for Mike Tyson like everybody else. Anybody that fought Mike Tyson had a fear for Mike Tyson himself before they got in the ring. They already knew Mike Tyson was going to knock him out. They were really just in there for a paycheck. It was fearful, right? So Buster Douglas said one of his greatest fears ever was to lose his mother. A few weeks before he fought Mike Tyson, his mother died. He confronted fear right there. So since fear was confronted right there, when he went into the ring with Mike Tyson, he, he had no more fear. Fear had already been faced. So when he went in there, he went in there without fear. You notice that the Bible says that um, God has not given up the spirit, the spirit of fear, but of a sound mind. It also says that perfect love casts out fear. And I, I, people quote that not even understand what it says. Christians go around and say, well, you know that perfect love casts out fear. But what does that really mean when he says that perfect love casts out fear? Perfect, the Bible means to be able to be mature. God says that once we've been through something and my love has become mature in you, you will no longer fear because that there's no need to fear what you know I'm handling because fear is a sign of you not trusting. So once I have matured you and I get you to trust and I teach you to have faith, I will remove fear. That's what the Bible talks about, you know, um, that we, should, we shouldn't fear nothing. He said, he said, don't fear the one who's able to kill the body. Fear the one who's able to kill the body and the spirit. God is teaching you and I to not to be fearful. So when Buster Douglas went in the ring with Mike Tyson, he had already confronted and faced fear. You must understand, listen, a lot of times we, you know, God gives you and I to a place that he says, you know what? In order to deal with what's coming, you know, I'm, I'm preparing you for it. But Buster Douglas didn't know that all the training he did to fight Mike Tyson, the, the piece he was missing was the heart. Yeah. He had the skill. Yeah. Listen, yeah. he didn't have the heart. Yeah. But the thing about it, when his mother died, now he has the heart because guess what? It's no fear there. No fear. Yeah. That's why the Bible says the enemy, that the devil comes about as a roaring lion seeking who may devour. The devil is hoping to roar. His roar is to what? Instill fear. Amen. Amen. So whenever, I always know when the devil is present based off of his roar because there's, when I say roar, there's always something in the atmosphere for you and I to fear. Right? Yeah. It's something right now that somebody in this room is worried about. Yeah. And it's going to work out for their good. But you're worried about it right now. Yeah. And, 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 you know, it leaves your mind for a little bit, but then it comes back. It leaves your mind for a little bit, it comes back. You know, yeah. you know you got a bill due, 
You know, you, you know you got something going on. You know you, you're getting close on a date for something. It's something in this room that you're worried about. So when he said he comes as a roaring lion, seek him when we may devour, he comes screaming something, roaring. What is he roaring? He's roaring something to, that has your attention that you're worried about. Then he comes with Philippians, oh, be anxious about nothing, everything by prayer and supplication, making your requests made known to God. But God, he's, he's giving me, I'm worried about something. Somebody can't sleep because they're worried about something. I'm, I'm worried that when the test results come out, I'm worried about what they're going to say this. I'm worried about, that's fear. He, he told, he, he told um, Job said it too. Job said, the thing that I fear most has come upon me. I fear losing everything, and here it is right in front of me. I'm losing everything. God says, I have to remove that fear. Perfect, loves, perfect love means that I'm developing you to have no fear because everything that the enemy is attacking you on is things that you fear, things that you're trying to protect. Yeah. He says, listen, perfect love, cast off fear. Jesus did that. Jesus told Peter that the devil would betray him. I mean, not, not, not told David to betray him. He told him that the devil desired to sift him as we. Jesus gave Peter, Peter a little bit of the future, like the psychics do. He told him something, and then, but he told Peter this. He says, listen, though you already know that the devil wants you, he says, I've already prayed for you. And he said, he told him, he says, I prayed for you, and I pray that your faith remain. And he says that when you are converted, strengthen your brethren. He told Peter this. He basically told him, the devil wants you, but I already prayed and you will come out of it. Amen. You notice Jesus never told him what the devil was going to do, how he was going to do it, never gave him all the information. He just told him that what you're going through, you're going to come out of it. One of the better teachers I like, if you ever look closely to the story when they said they was getting into the ship, Jesus told them this. He says, listen, let us cross over to the other side. And a lot of people, believe it or not, they said that's all the word they should have hung on. Let us cross over to the other side. You know what that meant? When he said that, that meant that they was going to make it from one place to another. He never told them, as we're crossing over to the other side, we're going to run into a storm. Because you know what? Somebody on a boat like me would have said, well, won't we wait a day? <laughs> right? Yeah. If it was me on the boat, I said, well, if there's going to be a storm, we should wait to go. But he says, you know what? I'm not going to tell you it's going to be a storm. Because if you know, then you'll make arrangements. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Come on, Pastor. Yeah. He says, I don't tell you stuff. Because when you know, you'll make arrangements. He, he, he shows Joseph all this stuff he wants to do with him in dreams. But don't show Joseph none of the stuff that he's going to go through. That's just who God is. Yeah. He, he's not a God. We're going back to the teaching. He's, he's not going to inform you of everything. And, and, and people feel like, well, you know what? Uh, I have a lot of people come to me, Pastor Q. I just want to know what God is doing in my life. Well, here's the thing. You don't want to come so consumed in looking what you're getting ready to receive from God that you miss serving God. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I, I've been there. A lot of us are there. We're so focused on what we receive, we forget to serve. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know what? Believe it or not, right? Most Christians are sitting around waiting for God to do something. Not serving. Waiting. People argue all the time. Ask me, what do you do while you wait? I'm like, serve. <laughs> what do you do when you wait on your food? When you go to a restaurant, right? <laughs> and you order. Oh, before you order. And they give you a little butter. It's going to be 25, 35, 45 minutes wait. You wait. That's right. Why do you wait? Because you're hungry. Well, not just that. You wait because you come there and you have your appetite fixed on what you want. So you say you'll wait for it. You wait to be seated and you wait to be served. Mm -hmm. Amen. All that waiting. That's what Christians are doing. But what did you do in between time? I'm just waiting. No. You got the, the, the Christian life is not set up for an individual to wait alone. God has not called you to seek him for something and then the whole time just sit around waiting for him to do it. And a lot of people are there. We're just sitting around, I'm just waiting on God to do this. 90% of people right now are what? Waiting on their taxes. If you haven't got them back already. 
mad at the male man. You know, he, he ain't bring my W. We ain't get the. <laughs> you already done filed before you got the paperwork. <laughs> you know? Everybody right now are waiting on their taxes. You already got the kids in line you're going to claim. You already know how much you're going to get back. You're already buying. Listen, he's a great teacher, right? People are more con so confident in their taxes. They already going to, they already have bought things and the money haven't even hit yet. But he said, when you pray, pray, believe you have already received it, and you online like you got your taxes back. <laughs> <laughs> I can't pray believing I've already received, but I can window shop like I've already received my direct <laughs> <laughs> I'm already living and talking like I got my taxes back, and I haven't got them back. Look at that cars and everything. Cars and clothes. <laughs> you online you with stuff in your bag. Amen. Yes, you got stuff in your cart, I mean. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> you got stuff in your saved cart. Checking your cart, checking your bank account. <laughs> right? See if the taxes hit yet. Because you already got a cart full of stuff, right? I'm teaching faith, though. Why is it that you can shop without evidence of funds? Shopping with our yeah. evidence of funds. But when he says pray, believing you have already received, you're not living like you already have. Yeah. Yeah. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this word. We thank you for the time. Must be obedient, the time restraints. We thank you, Lord, for helping us and being with us and developing us through the teachings of the word. Father God, we will trust you in all things. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand for you. Amen. Amen. All those who are watching, we thank you guys for joining us today. Hear word. We'll be blessed. Amen. We're going to go forward.